Great. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Elise Franco. I'm the staff reporter for Charlotte Inno. Welcome to Inno's um, first State of Innovation of 2021. Today's conversations are going to center around adapting to business changes. If you have any questions for the panel or for Charlotte Inno during the event, please drop those questions in the chat box and we're, we will have a, a Q&A session after the discussion. Before we dive into the conversation, for anybody unfamiliar with us and what we do, Inno is part of a growing network of sites. We're committed to covering and connecting local technology, startups, growth, and innovation. Charlotte Inno covers the local ecosystem via daily stories, a twice a week newsletter, and quarterly virtual events. Check us out at charlotteinno.com to see what we're all about and sign up for The Beat, which is our twice a week newsletter. The Beat really is the best way to stay plugged into everything that's impacting the local innovation ecosystem. In it, you're gonna get the local technology and startup news you need, analysis you won't find anywhere else, info on upcoming events and cool job openings, and much more. Um, first, I'm gonna, I would like to thank our sponsors, our founding partner, the City of Charlotte, our supporting partners, Dual Boot Partners and Charlotte Business Resources, and our gold partners, Accenture, and Entrepreneurs Organization Charlotte. At this time, please welcome Brian Delaney with Entrepreneurs Organization Charlotte to share a few remarks. Hi, Brian. Hey, Elise. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name's Brian Delaney, uh, co-founder of Skookum. I'm also uh, on the EO board here locally in Charlotte and run an accelerator in town, um, helping small businesses scale past a million in revenue. Uh, EO Charlotte is excited to sponsor this event and, uh, if you don't know, EO stands for Entrepreneurs Organization. And so the EO is a global network of successful entrepreneurs who support each other's businesses, uh, business growth and personal growth. Charlotte's chapter, which I represent, uh, is committed to the growth of our emerging community here in Charlotte. Being an entrepreneur is certainly a challenge in any city, but when I joined EO 10 years ago, I found something I was missing in Charlotte among all the large corporations. Uh, I found connection with an entrepreneurial peer group uh, to share experiences with and learn from. And while that started in Charlotte, I've now developed relationships with entrepreneurs all over the world. And never was that connection more important and more powerful than over the last year. COVID was an explanation, exclamation point uh, for how, how we support each other here in EO. Not a single Charlotte EO member's business closed due to COVID and the way we rallied around each other and support each other. Uh, if you want to be a part of that, please reach out to us. We'd love to talk about it, um, but I'll turn it back over to Elise. We have a great lineup of speakers today to talk about the impact of COVID on businesses moving forward. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Brian, and, and thanks for letting our audience today know about EO. All right, um, next I'm going to welcome our panel. Um, first, we've got Dan Aquisto, co-founder of 2U Laundry. Hey, hey, Elise, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Dan DeQuisto. Uh, as Elise mentioned, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Charlotte-based 2U Laundry. Uh, we're a laundry and dry cleaning pickup and delivery service that you can schedule right from your phone, get your clothes picked up from right outside your front door, cleaned exactly to your preferences and brought back the very next day. Uh, I'm also a co-founder of, uh, of another company we started here through the pivot um, called Laundro Lab, our franchising concept, which I'll touch on a little bit more later on, uh, but excited to be here and uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Dan. Next up, we've got Mohan Giridharadas. He is the founder and CEO of Lintas. Thanks, Elise. It's great to be here. My name is Mohan Giridharadas. I'm the founder and CEO of Lintas. So we are a 200-person software company based in Silicon Valley and in Charlotte. What we do is essentially uh, help hospitals and health systems optimize the use of their assets, like operating rooms and chemo chairs, et cetera, through crazy math and software. We work with uh, 100 prominent health systems around the country, including the ones well-known in Charlotte and North Carolina, like Novant, Atrium, Duke, Wake Med, Wake Forest, et cetera. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Next up is Adrian Mayans, co-founder of Lucidrone Technologies. Hey, Elise, thanks for having me, everyone. So I'm Adrian Mayans, co-founder of Lucid Drone Tech, um, also a Charlotte-based company. Um, after being out in Silicon Valley for a little bit out at Y Combinator, um, we build productive industrial drones for dangerous and dirty jobs. 
So we're actually a tech company, not a service provider. We've basically made cleaning safer and more efficient by taking human workers off of lifts and scaffolds and to operating our drones. So what we do is empower these cleaning companies to benefit from drone technology. Um, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Adrian. And finally, we have Maggie Williams, founder and CEO of Skip Town. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Maggie Williams. I'm the CEO and founder of Skip Town. We are on a mission to make the lives of pets and their people easier and even more fun. And we do that through a dog-focused oasis, a country club for dogs of sorts. Um, our flagship location is in Southend. It's a 24,000 square foot facility where we offer pet services, including dog daycare, boarding, and a self-serve dog wash. Um, we also have an indoor outdoor off-leash bar and park. Uh, we launched in August of last year. In August of last year? And now we're expanding and across we're expanding. the country and are on track to open three more locations by the end of next year. Thanks, Maggie. All right, we're going to dive right in. Um, my first question for all of you today is how were each of you impacted by the pandemic and how different did your day-to-day -day operations look in February of 2020 compared to how they look today? Um, and we will start with Dan. All right, so uh, just to reiterate the question, it was to how we were impacted by the pandemic and then what do we look like uh, uh, February 2020 versus today, correct? Awesome. Yeah, so uh, our business uh, was uh, unfortunately impacted pretty significantly by COVID. Uh, I remember uh, we had just closed our, uh, our Series A in uh, October of 2019 with plans to aggressively expand uh, our two laundry service offering across the Southeast. Uh, and we, we did that and uh, doubled our service area in Atlanta uh, and we launched our third market of Raleigh uh, in January of 2020. Uh, March came around pretty quickly, and uh, uh, I remember March 15th, our, our pickups dropped off pretty considerably across all three markets, and, and we made the, the quick decision to uh, um, kind of uh, take a step back, and, and as a startup, uh, you have to pivot quickly, and, and uh, capital is obviously a, a big constraint, and so uh, we were fortunate to just have raised a, a decent round of funding. Um, and uh, allowed ourselves to kind of weather through the storm. And so we, we pulled our service uh, operations out of Atlanta completely um, and also out of Raleigh um, to kind of take that step back, as I mentioned, to really understand how COVID was going to impact the broader landscape. Um, our consumer behavior changed overnight. Um, uh, people start, didn't go, weren't going into the office. People weren't traveling. Uh, uh, kids weren't going to school. And so our, our services is, is one of those affordable luxury type services that um, are, are uh, uh, people just really weren't having the need um, at that time, especially March, April, May. Um, it's picked back up, uh, thankfully, to uh, pre-COVID levels and beyond uh, as of, as of uh, this month, which is exciting, um, uh, seeing those consumer behaviors coming back. Um, we're still only operating in Charlotte right now, so we went from uh, a, uh, a team of about 35 to 40 salaried employees to about uh, uh, 20 um, right now. And then, um, uh, again, we're still only offering our services in Charlotte. Um, one of the exciting things as uh, challenges come as entrepreneurs, we look for opportunities and, and ways to pivot. And, and uh, our exciting pivot uh, through this has been focused on uh, taking our brick and mortar uh, laundromat that we had built back in 2018 uh, in, uh, with a relationship with Electrolux, whose U.S. headquarters happens to be here. Uh, we built the first of its kind five-star amenity-ridden laundromat in, in, uh, in a lower-income community that uh, needs uh, services like uh, a laundromat to be able to take the traditional recurring habitual chore of laundry off their plate in a um, in a convenient manner and so uh, we built that uh, back in 2018 and and through the pandemic we realized that that service was an essential business um, it was uh, deemed essential in all 50 states and and we we saw an increase in our revenues uh, um, across the, the pandemic and, and we looked at our our two growth model and and realized that uh, our backbone is our laundromats and and uh, we had planned to, to build those ourselves going forward, but opened up uh, a completely new first of its kind franchising opportunity with laundromats that we're really excited about uh, that uh, we've basically been incubating that business 
uh, the last nine, 10 months and officially came to market um, in January of 2021, um, starting to offer uh, and award licenses to uh, prospective uh, laundromat owners. And um, we should have our first nine stores here closed in the uh, uh, deals done within the next couple of weeks. Um, and we're starting to gain that traction and, and we're looking to, to sell about 20 to 30 licenses across the South and Southeast. Uh, over the next uh, uh, remaining part of 2021. And so we're gearing up for an aggressive uh, brick and mortar expansion through through franchising. Uh, and then uh, as those get built up, coming on and layering our two laundry business on top of those in the respective markets that we're, we're looking to expand into. And so uh, it was a blessing in disguise uh, that we look at internally. It, it ultimately uncovered up new doors for us to to open and and venture down and and uh, we couldn't be more excited, optimistic. The team has uh, incredibly high energy and, and we're ready to uh, shift things around here in 2021. Thanks, Dan. Um, I'd love to hear um, how that that's, how that's impacted um, the rest of you. Yeah, I can, I can jump in. So, you know, similar to, to Dan and Alex, we, you know, saw a, a massive drop at, at the time we were a dog walking company predominantly. So we were gearing up to pivot to the Skip Town model um, the later that year. And we, at the time we were doing about 230 visits a day. So about a million dollar run rate. Um, and in, in the span of a week, we saw about 95% of our revenue disappear. Um, people started working from home. They, you know, the uncertainty dog walking, you know, got cut. Um, from from most people's most consumers lives and you know at that point we had to make some pretty hard decisions we you know reduced the team by over 90 percent um let we had to let go of our dog walkers we furloughed a third of our back office team everybody took um salary reductions um, i stopped taking a salary altogether i mean it was a really tough couple months as we were trying to, to kind of hone in on critical path work and really gear ourselves toward launching skip town which you know, we had already had, had invested in as, as being the future. Um, I would say that, you know, the, the moment that I really knew that, that that this was getting real was I was in California for a work conference when the NBA shut down. And I got a call from three investors at the time we were, I was raising a round of funding to support the launch of Skip Town. And I got a call from three investors within the span of two hours saying, who had international clients and they were just saying things are getting really bad and we're not we're not going to be able to invest in this round and that was like a real eye opener i took the red eye home i called the leadership team in at like 6 30 in the morning and it was then that we started to plan out we have to we're gonna the company that we were is no longer who we are and we have to figure out who we're going to be um through this and that was kind of the that was the the big turning point um back in march of 2020 and then you know it's also similar similarly there's been a lot of silver linings you know there's been a lot of dogs adopted in covid we've been able to see how much people truly care about their pets um and and when we launched skip town you know despite being in the global pandemic we were able to build a ton of traction um for the services we were offering and so it's put us in a totally different game now um, which is why we're excited to expand so quickly um now that we've got this proof of concept off the ground and it's it's been um, getting as much traction and, and support as it has. Awesome. Adrian, I know Lucid Drone made um, a huge pivot in 2020. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. So, yeah, I mean, the cleaning industry took a huge hit. As Dan said, we're also, I think, what he kind of coined as an affordable luxury. Um, you know, exterior cleaning kind of is a nice to have besides cleaning windows. Um, again, it's it's very much a nice to have where we found ourselves, uh, you know, amidst the pandemic, a majority of our customer base said, hey, you know, we're still extremely interested in your technology. You know, we want to move forward with this. We understand how it's going to impact our operations and our business, but we just can't justify this expense right now. So very similarly, we had to take a step back and essentially say, okay, what, you know, what does Lucid, you know, in this pandemic really look like and we realized that we were we were in a position to actually help fight covid so as you said at least today we actually have a disinfecting drone in the market so essentially what we did was uh really retrofit our cleaning drone um it basically went heads down for about a two-month product sprint thankfully there's a ton of crossover on the hardware and software side between the cleaning drone and the disinfecting drone so now essentially we have an onboard tank with electrostatic which is 
what's really used in the disinfecting space. We didn't really have to reinvent the wheel. We more so said, okay, how is disinfecting happening today? And how can we improve these operations? So now we're working with some NFL customers, um, some NBA customers, and disinfecting the arena. So essentially anything that our drone flies over is getting elect electrostatically disinfected. So again, as Dan said, for us, it, it was a blessing in disguise. Um, I'd say it definitely made us move towards expanding our product line quicker than we had, had anticipated. Um, but still, you know, now where we find ourselves is, you know, we have two product lines. The cleaning space, thankfully, is, you know, getting back on its feet. People are getting back into buildings and that we see that demand ramping up uh, pretty quickly now. So, you know, in terms of allocating our headcount bandwidth, um, kind of all of that, there obviously is now we have two product lines. So there's there's a lot of understanding um, really how all of those you know, kind of trade off of each other. So obviously it brings new problems, but a ton of opportunity for us. What, what at first looked like a really, uh, you know, scary situation of, you know, how do we, how do we stay, you know, in business? Thankfully we didn't have to cut any employees um, or have to do anything like that. We were able to pretty quickly move towards disinfecting, um, which, you know, kind of proved what we had, you know, for a long time kind of said was, was a really key part of what we're doing here, which is, uh, a base frame that allows us to, you know, quickly do other applications for drones because, again, we there's deeper problems in the drone space that I could get into um, a little bit later. But having that kind of modular base platform that we could spin off of was always central to our strategy, and we just had to kind of put that into action quicker than we had anticipated. All right. And Mohan, um, do you have anything to add? We have uh, very similar experiences. Our initial uh, pressures created at the start of COVID was health systems feeling pinched financially. Uh, and therefore, we had a few cancel their contracts or pause their contracts, which obviously caused us concern. We had three products at the time, uh, optimizing chemotherapy, optimizing operating rooms, and optimizing the uh, clinic visits. The clinic visits... Uh, changed dramatically with COVID because 70% of appointments overnight went to telehealth. Uh, and so all of a sudden, people didn't have as much uh, energy about coming into a doctor's office. And all the historical data went away because they were innovating on the fly, check-ins while you're in the car, text message check-ins and so on. So we made the difficult decision, but made it very quickly to put our clinics product on pause. And so we paused it completely. It's still on pause. We bring it out next year. But um, in some ways, the, the pandemic created a positive energy for us as well, because health systems suddenly became aware that it takes sophisticated math to balance supply and demand. They were running short of PPE first, then they were running short of ventilators, then they were running short of ICU beds. And so our whole thing is around sophisticated math to balance supply and demand. Uh, and so it ended up creating momentum for us to launch a, a new product on inpatient beds uh, which is now controlling about 2,000 beds uh, in 13 hospitals uh, at the moment. So that got launched in the middle of the pandemic. New launches um, coming off of Pivot seem to be the the trend, with, you know, obviously with you guys, but with most of the other founders and entrepreneurs I've spoken to over the last year. So that's great. Um, and kind of playing off that last question, how did the need to pivot because of the pandemic um, influence your your business model and focus moving forward? For us, the newest thing was the way we would deploy our software, we would send our teams on site, not for a long time, maybe for eight or 10 weeks, there'd be a team of three or four people on site three or four days a week. So that's what it takes to get our software up and running. Well, in the middle of the pandemic, health systems rightfully didn't have a lot of energy for outsiders to come into the health system. They weren't letting family be by the bedside of their patients. So they certainly didn't want outsiders in their system. and so. We pivoted very quickly to be able to deploy our products remotely. So as an extreme example, Novant right there in Charlotte uh, was a shining example for us. We went live with our operating rooms product in a six week period, 20 facilities, 120 operating rooms, over a thousand staff trained, and no one from our team set foot on any Novant property even once during that period. So we managed to build our entire delivery model to be remote which is fantastic for us now because we continue to deploy remotely. We haven't visited a customer site uh, in 12 months, uh, and yet we've grown 40% in 2020. So 
Uh, so it's actually helped us sharpen our delivery, make it more robust, make it more scalable, uh, and make it more automated. Wow. I, th I think for for us, uh, the biggest thing was uh, we really had to take a step back, as as I mentioned or alluded to earlier, with being an affordable luxury business and and seeing the immediate impact COVID had, we had to kind of weather the storm and, and take a step back. And and we had a, a, an incredible board meeting. I remember that um, uh, the board kind of gave us uh, some foresight into saying, hey, there's no playbook for this, um, but this is an opportunity for you. You're in a, a fortunate position where you've just raised capital. Um, you have a, an awesome team. You have five years of learning. Um, fail, failure, successes behind you, and and now um, take all that, take a blank piece of paper, and uh, go reimagine uh, what what to you looks like coming out the other end of this, whether that's in six months or a year. And we took that seriously. We took that to heart. Um, similar to what uh, Maggie was saying, uh, we brought our leadership team in, and and so we we basically had a white blank whiteboard and uh, reinvented what to you 2.0 looks like coming out the other end of this. And we came up with uh, two very clear company objectives that we were going to focus on. Um, one of them was sort of reinventing our pickup and delivery business to cater to our core customer instead of offering a service that was for this massive wide spectrum that just had a bunch of other complications within it being lower cost, more mass market. We decided to kind of take the approach to swim upstream uh, and go after the, the recurring um, uh, high spending customer and build a service and product that was going to be uh, for them. Um, and uh, uh, that, that was the main focus for the team on the, on the 2U 2.0 component. Um, outside of that, we basically came in and said, hey, we're going to build a business from scratch and sort of incubate inside of our uh, already existing startup. And, and that was with our brick and mortar asset that really was kind of secondary to our pickup and delivery business. It was more of just our, our back end uh, support model um, that really sort of flourished in the pandemic and opened our eyes to uh, a completely new business model um, that you take this, this tech enabled service um, that had a pickup and delivery component. And, and we're completely focusing our team on now uh, a brick and mortar franchising concept, which uh, if anyone is aware, franchising is just a completely different business model than your traditional startup uh, venture capital path. And so we had to educate ourselves pretty aggressively um, and quickly. Uh, and uh, we sort of applied that same approach we had in our first year as uh, starting to you, everyone wearing many hats, um, working long hours and and uh, really just re-educating ourselves on a, on a new model. And and uh, we were fortunate at the time to have enough capital and, and resources to work with the best of the best to help educate us quickly and and uh, spin up and come to market with a, a completely new offering. And so um, uh, the team had to had to learn quite a bit. Um, and uh, it's imp it's impressive and that much more inspiring. Uh, as a founder, to see how uh, not only the the founders but also your 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 core employees sort of react and and are open and adapt to that change, and so um, that's been honestly the the coolest part about this. Um, it, we've had to make some tough decisions, but uh, it's been ultimately that much more inspiring to see uh, the pivot, the challenges, and and ultimately the perseverance uh, through it from from not only Alex and I, our investors, our customers, but but our employees as well. And so uh, again, that much more optimistic about where we're headed here in the future um, uh, with a completely new path forward. Thanks, Dan. We were in the middle of a pivot. Um, we were gearing up to switch from a dog walking focused company to that the ecosystem model with Skip Town and, and launch a whole bunch of businesses within. So it became, you know, for me, the, the, the move from non-COVID to COVID world was really about going from a peacetime to a wartime scenario. Um, and it, it was like going from playing to win to playing not to lose. And that was the pivot inside of the pivot for us. In a peacetime world, you are able to deploy a lot of creativity. There's broad-based focuses, you know, there's big picture, you be very, you know, you can make really detailed decisions. And when there's a wartime scenario, there's this existential threat that's imminent that's coming at you and nothing else matters but surviving. And so going from a scenario where we were more flexible, kind of experimenting in a, in a much more peacetime 
you know, mindset and then very quickly changing to how fast can we reduce cost? Can we only care about critical path work and then really disregard everything else? That kind of became the mantra. And it was everything was how do we get Skip Town launched? And that was the core focus, you know, of, as you know, as we kind of got deeper into the into the COVID world. Um, and I think, you know, being there, it's it's like not just a pivot of the business, it's like a, it's a pivot of the mindset and how external crises bring people together. Similarly, our team really rallied at a time when, you know, we needed that morale, we needed, you know, we needed the kind of positive and we're going to get through this and we're going to do whatever it takes that had really been the basis of how we started. Um, and it kind of got us back to our roots in a lot of ways um, and really drove us toward that singular mission, which, you know, I think is clarifying and, and you know, a really positive exercise, you know, um, around unfortunate circumstances, but, but finding yourself in a place where, you know, it really does remind you, you know, what you're doing and, and what matters. Yeah, as, as Maggie said, um, you know, we definitely saw, looked at this existential threat, right, and took a step back. And at the end of the day, our business model really wasn't impacted. Um, we still lease drones to third party service providers. We did have internal conversations. And as Dan said, kind of looked at a whiteboard and said, you know, realize that we're in a position to kind of reinvent ourselves and say, OK, um, what is this optimal path forward? Kind of all, all systems go at this point, as, as Maggie said, this is this is a survival play now. Um, so for us, you know, we we looked into potentially service providing, um, realized that the reason that, you know, the customers slowed down on the cleaning side, it wasn't only the service providers, it was the, the brick and mortar locations no longer needed cleaning. Um, so again, for us, our business model wasn't really fundamentally impacted at all. Really, the biggest thing was opening a new product line significantly sooner than we had anticipated. All right. And Maggie, you mentioned your mission a minute ago. Um, so I want to start with you with this next question. What impact, what long term impact did COVID um, have on your startup's mission? The question's for all of you, but I, I want to start with Maggie here. Yeah, for us, it was it validated the product market fit that we have. In the middle of the pandemic, we sold, before we launched, we opened up membership sales as like a, let's see how this goes, right? Middle of the pandemic, you know, we're trying to open a bar, we're trying to open pet care services that rely on people mostly being out of the home, right? And when with a month that we before we opened, we sold over 800 memberships. And for me, that was the first real sign that we had something, we have strong product market fit. And even in the middle of a global pandemic, people are going to, People care about their dogs. They are going to make sure their dogs are healthy and healthy and happy, and they're going to invest in their in their pets and in their pet parenting lifestyle. And since then, we've you know we're, we're at almost at capacity from a pet care side. So when we didn't anticipate that, so I would say if anything, it has supercharged what this service offering can be and the impact it can have, not just in Charlotte but nationally. And I think all of our, our you know, our stakeholders, our supporters, our investors, our team, Net sees what this can be, given what we've done, despite you know all odds that would have you know very easily you know changed our expectations on what we th what we thought we could have done. Um, has now really put us in the realm of, okay, how, how can we amplify this? How can we grow as fast as possible while maintaining the quality, enhancing the quality? And, and how can we serve this need across the country, um, knowing especially how many more people got dogs during the pandemic? Um, so we see a big opportunity going forward. And I think the proof point was um, being able to do this in, in the pandemic. I'll go uh, on on this one next. For us, it was it was pretty simple. Um, our mission is really to be one of the uh, the first nationally recognized brand uh, in laundry and dry cleaning um, in a in a service based space. And uh, um, that mission hasn't changed, and it and it won't change. The the means to get there has. Um, we always uh, had plans to expand, and uh, expansion pre COVID was. Uh, uh, aggressively doing so with our pickup and delivery business model, uh, asset light launching into a market, um, getting to that uh, uh, volume or, or size point to where it made sense to vertically integrate and build our own 
um, corporate stores and, and and do that. And that path was uh, uh, definitely expected to raise venture, a significant amount of rent, venture capital to do so. And we knew that. Um, our path now is, is still very focused on expansion. Um, we've uncovered a, a different way to do that. And and instead of uh, raising venture capital, we found a way to do it by way of uh, franchising, um, which has its own perks in and of itself. It's a it's a more challenging approach, but it allows uh, the main core investors, myself and our employees, to continue to hold a, a larger stake on on the equity side, and and uh, that ultimately helps fuel motivation and. And we can gain um, not only the the expansion but also capital um, through that through that franchising model, and uh, that in and of itself opened up completely new sort of mission and and vision to uh, make an impact um, with uh, allowing and enabling these uh, new types of owners and investors um, to come in and and buy into a really exciting uh, competitive uh, like business model um, to generate some additional income. Um, and cr creating uh, uh, entrepreneurs, as we call them internally, um, people who want to buy into a, to the model, um, but maybe don't want to start it on their own. Um, that also is a business model that that impacts our local communities. We're we're building in the lower income uh, parts of town and and building a five star business that's affordable for people who have an absolute need uh, for our service, and and uh, we're making that splash. Um, and we're excited to make that impact uh, by way of this new sort of means to the same end. And so our mission remains intact um, and ultimately fuels that, uh, that inspiration that the team and, and our customers have in that overall voice and message. Our mission also remained the same. Our mission was to transform healthcare operations across the United States. Uh, and we believe that applying sophisticated mathematics and software can do wonders for patients, reduce their wait times, create more opportunities for them to, to receive medical care, et cetera. Right before the pandemic, Forbes invited us to write a book. And so we used the downtime of the initial six months, uh, since we weren't traveling anymore and had all kinds of time at home, for the chief operating officer of our company and myself to co-author a book, which we call Better Healthcare Through Math, uh, and that book is now out and it's helping us uh, reinforce the mission and continue the way we were. All right. Um, and so I believe each of you has mentioned fundraising at one point or another. Um, for anyone who has raised money in the past or is currently working on a fundraise, what has that been like um, and how has it been different compared to fundraising pre-COVID? I'll start with Adrian on this one. Yeah, I can start off. So we have not raised money um, during the pandemic. I will say that um, a good amount of people that I know, that I met out west at Y Combinator have. And I think at first there was a really big fear that venture capital money was going to kind of shore up and people were going to be really reserved. Um, as you guys have probably seen, that hasn't necessarily been the case. There's still a lot of money flowing. I think the overall sentiment is still really positive. I think people are really and I think this is shown in public markets as well, where we had this massive crash, right? This huge fear and then a very, very quick rebound. Um, so for us, I think I think there's still obviously extremely high discretion um, in those spaces, but I think companies that you know are continuing to push the envelope and find success in what they do, um, I haven't seen kind of any any difficulties raising capital. Um, if anything, I've seen uh, I've seen you know an, an increase in in money out there uh, i'm sure you guys have seen there's a ton of you know rolling funds coming out um you know angels there there's the there are new angels i mean on a on a daily basis um you know just really getting into the space and people are realizing that you know these these private markets is a place where you know re kind of regular people can can you know have opportunity um we funder these these public platforms are also gaining a ton of traction um, so, I mean, I think the overall sentiment has been really positive, um, you know, all things considered. You know what, I would, I agree with you on that. It, it almost seems like there was a, a brief pause where, you know, the investors, angel or venture capital or whoever kind of um, wanted to see what was going to happen. Um, mm -hmm. And then the opportunities really kind of started flowing again. And, and like you said, they've, they've been pretty consistent. 
Yeah, we, we haven't had to uh, raise capital. Um, we did, thankfully, right before COVID happened. Um, but the, the whole venture capital scene um, definitely was a, a large influence on um, how we approach sort of like that whiteboarding, reinventing ourselves session. And, and again, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we were going down this path of, of we were going to have to aggressively raise venture capital um, where it made sense in, in a, a mass market sort of a, a high growth business, um, launching market by market. And, and so we, we took that step back and, and we realized that if we want to create those opportunities to raise capital in the future, um, I, I think there, there's, there's always going to be access to that capital, but it's going to be maybe, let's say, harder. Uh, more, they're going to be more critical um, with the startups and how they're performing and, and how their metrics are, especially now having to be able to compare something, what happened to you during COVID or, or during a few, uh, what's going to happen to you during a recession. Um, and you're going to have to answer those questions and, and now even have, have proof uh, of how you performed. And, and I think the biggest thing is uh, a lot of the uh, at least service based businesses like ours um, are going to be uh, more critical to uh, profitability um, and how you're effectively spending money and, and where you can can put it. You, you're just going to have to be able to answer that question. It's not just going to be about building more technology or hiring more people. Um, there's got to be a, a, a critical component to your business on why you need the capital and and where it's going to go. And, and it's ultimately going to come down to. Uh, um, uh, the valuation based on profitability, um, and it's not just grow for growth's sake. Um, it's a it's a critical um, sort of a methodical growth path that you should be going down, and and at least that's what we've experienced and had conversations with with our existing investors on how they look at it. Um, and it, it really just much it was more of a, of an influence on how we were going to proceed forward versus um, t actually going out and raising capital. I'm Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. For us, between the end of 2017 and the start of 2020, we had collectively raised about $120 million. So we were quite well capitalized. Going into the pandemic, we had a fairly strong balance sheet. So in the February, March, April timeframe, when the pandemic was just getting uh, rolling, if you will, we felt we were solid on the balance sheet. And then we started to worry that this thing may stretch out for 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. There wasn't a clear end in sight. And we didn't want to be caught with a weak balance sheet and be forced to do unnatural things. And so around July, we decided to go ahead and raise a big round again, which obviously was challenging in the middle of, the, of a pandemic to go out and raise a, a really large round. But we did it uh, on the basis of strength. We had the balance sheet. We had the customers. We had demonstrated it. We had to show slightly different things. We had to show resilience in the face of the pandemic. We had to show a modified delivery model, show that we could grow despite it and maintain low churn that people wouldn't, uh, uh, customers wouldn't cancel on us. And so between July and November, we were able to show all of those things. And at the end of November, we closed another $130 million round uh, to just make sure that we would be fine uh, over an extended period of the pandemic. And since that closed at the end of 2020, We've come into 2021 fairly strong from a funding standpoint. Great. Maggie, did you have anything to add there? Yeah, I would say for our industry, I mean, there the expectations with the new pet parents that we have is that our industry is going to grow from a hundred billion dollar industry to a 275 billion dollar industry by the end of 2030. So I think that we are walking into a very capital rich environment for us as a company with, you know, with strong unit, unit economics, not, you know, I agree with Dan and, you know, it was a growth for growth sake VC model that we've now pulled away from and it's let's get really strong unit economics in each location. Um, let's, let's raise off of profitability, which we are in the position to do and it totally changes the game. Um, you know, I would also just say that I think going through COVID, you know, it's a totally different world going out now. I think we, you know, knock on wood, are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I know that my family's vaccinated, most of our team's vaccinated. So there's a lot to celebrate there. I will make a mention that PPP really saved us. We hadn't just raised around. And so we were really like, and, and we lost a bunch of investment when COVID hit because there was all that uncertainty. And, and honestly, getting the PPP money really gave us 
the power to, to continue to push forward to get Skip Town constructed. And so I think about that and how, how important that was for us to continue to not just survive, but then thrive. And now, now that we you know have gotten through that and we were able to keep our employees and um you know we paid back the reduced salary that we had that they had taken like we're really kind of making this whole i'd say going forward it's a whole new world because people are recognized in the pet world you know what you know what people are investing in and i see we see a real long tail of success there but uh it's there would definitely been two different chapters um since like you know being immersed in the middle of it to now really seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and we are very optimistic about where this goes that's a great point about the PPP. Um, it seems like in the startup space, we talk mostly about, um, you know, VCs, angel investors, and not really about the uh, the the PPP uh, loans. So that's a really great point. Um, I am going to jump to the audience questions a little bit early um, because we do have a handful of really good ones. Um, so the first question is for everybody on the panel. Um, feel free to jump in. Did you find more value in reworking existing products or adding additional products? I, I can start. Um, for us, it I think just the nature of our business, um, it, it in and of itself was a reworking, right? We have, we have this base platform and we needed to find a new way to utilize it and provide value with it. Um, I would say, you know, I'm interested to kind of hear what what other people kind of on the panel, the type of, you know, approach that they had. Again, when you kind of take this whiteboard approach and take a step back and, and reinvent your business, I think it's very much, you know, what do I have today? What are our key pillars? And how can I, you know, how can I reposition this to, you know, provide value in the COVID world? Because as we, as I think it was Dan that had said it, um, what his advisor said, I had the same exact word said, there's no playbook for this. Um, it very much was kind of an all hands on deck. How do we make do? Obviously, Mohan um, is in a much different you know, scenario with uh, you know, just raising $130 million throughout the pandemic. Obviously, smaller, earlier stage companies, it, it's a much more existential threat. Um, a point that I wanted to add, actually, um, something that Mohan said, he used the word show when we were talking about um, Kind of what you needed to do to be able to raise capital in this world i think particularly for really early stage companies i think it gave a platform for founders to show their scrappiness um obviously when when someone puts money in a company you're you're taking a bet on the founding team and i think covid while obviously brought a ton of difficulties um i think it really let some you know founders really flex their muscles on you know, how they can problem solve, how they could show their scrappiness. Thanks, Adrian. We we took ours, we, we looked at our existing products or services. Um, and, and again, really everything was on the table. We explored, hey, how do we create uh, or, or pick up and deliver essential uh, products that customers are looking for. We looked at uh, um, creating our own line of detergent so our customers, instead of uh, outsourcing their laundry, they could do it in their own homes, but still touching and feeling our brand. Um, and those things just never really uh, um, were the right move for us. Um, and so we really look and reinvented our existing products and services and went deep um, instead of going instead of going wide. Um, we went deep on, on on our product, and that's really where we we took a look, took that lens off of this hyper growth. You got to go, you got to go to okay. We actually have time right now to look at what we've been doing and what we've done, uh, assess our failures, assess our our successes, um, and really look at how things were kind of performing almost on autopilot. Um, to then say, hey, what can we go put our fuel behind? Um, and that's really where we saw the opportunity with uh, continuing to reinvent ourselves on our pickup and delivery service, um, which uh, with us, we have two products, laundry and dry cleaning. Dry cleaning is one of those things. It was probably one of the most impacted industries with airfare and travel and hospitality. Um, dry cleaning is one of those businesses that just isn't going to come back to the level that it was uh, ever, in my opinion, um, uh, just based on research and consumer behavior. Uh, but laundry is one of those things that we're seeing people now um, equally as busy as they were previously pre-COVID, even in more cases, more busy because they're trying to adapt to a new norm. And so they're seeking these services that are going to help them and allow them to focus on 
those uh, those memorable moments that they have with their families and and just knowing that that's uh, more critical than ever now and, and then it opened our eyes to our brick and mortar location that was basically sitting uh, and also running on autopilot to, to show that hey there's some fuel that we can put behind this and have a whole other exciting multi-million dollar company uh, within that and so that that's kind of how we approached it versus we did look at new products and services to offer but um, at the end of the day, um, we had some success uh, with uh, our core products and, and sort of reinvented those to, uh, uh, to fuel them up and, and bring back to market. Okay. We did three things. We augmented our existing products, not just uh, stayed with them, but we found because people were canceling surgeries, they needed a backlog calculator. They needed a way to manage the backlog of surgeries. Because they were doing more social distancing and chemotherapy by leaving alternate chairs empty, they needed new ways of thinking about it. So we augmented our tools. The other interesting thing we stumbled on was there was a hunger for information. What are other people doing? Because health systems didn't have a playbook either. They were learning from each other. And since we had 100 health systems as our customers, we put on webinars where you could have leading institutions talk about what they were doing. And we would have 500 people attend the webinar to learn from their peers. So it allowed us to be in the discussion stream a little bit more. Uh, and then we launched one new product to deal with the bench. So we did, we followed a three-prong attack uh, of augment, leverage the community, and uh, invent. Okay. Um, just for time purposes, I'm going to jump to the next question. Um, this one is a two-parter. What would you tell local startups or businesses in the launch phase who have received loans from marketing and advertising initiatives? Um, to focus their spending on and then the second part to that is did you ever find that you had the best luck with a specific type of marketing to help launch your business i'll start with meggie on that one um geez well all the pivots we've ever done are because we've learned something that wasn't working as best as it could and could work better and so we changed what we did and so we kind of consider ourselves like the king of, of pivots. Uh, Stories about going company or doing something very different. It was learning, you know, where the impact really lies. But I think at the core of that is product market fit. And I think that it is overlooked as something that, you know, and we did it too. You have this idea, you get some traction in it and you kind of go full bore into that. And a lot of times there needs to be, I believe, a lot more rigor around really verifying product market fit for anything that you do. And I define product market fit fit in three ways. Um, the pervasiveness of a problem, so how big is this issue? The um, time sensitivity to that problem, do people need to solve this problem within an, in, in a sort of a, an immediacy? Um, and then what are their willingness to pay? And we, for dog walking, we had, we had the willingness to pay and the urgency, but not, the pervasiveness was limited, right? It was a smaller group of people that we found out was really using dog walking services. And we had built all this tech and processes and people around a service that, you know, was, was limited in scope um, is for what we were going after. And so I would just push, I would say that product market fit is king and understanding your customers and understanding the market need and the urgency, the willingness to pay, how big the problem is, is everything. And before you go and spend a ton of money necessarily marketing it, you should find out if your service, if your product is really gonna fit that need and if, if you're going after the right thing. Um, I think that, you know, that would be my, that, that would be my advice. Okay. I couldn't agree, yeah, I couldn't agree more with Meggie on that, uh, with the emphasis on product market fit. Um, one thing that we've always sort of had the mindset around around marketing is just uh, constraint equals creativity. And uh, once you have access to capital, um, I mean, it's exciting to go raise money and see that investors are buying into your business and, and they believe in what you're doing. But it's also just as easy to go uh, spend that money very quickly and not effectively. And uh, we've always pretended like we don't have any money in the bank, um, uh, especially in the early days uh, and, and kind of uh, continuing to play off of what Maggie said about product market fit. And before you go spend and spin up an agency or uh, hire a brand consultant or, or 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 go spend aggressively on on marketing. You need to do it yourself. Do it very hacky. You don't have to have this professional video or or all these professionals helping you out do it. You need to go uh, do it yourself first. And that's exactly what we did. We we could have went and and raise money to go spend on Facebook and Google and and influencers and all of this. And and uh, there was times that if we did that, 
uh, but we did it ourselves first. We went out and talked to the market, um, got customers on Facebook groups. Uh, there's so many play, places that you can uh, spread your message and word. And even if you're talking, you, mean, you need a sample size of 30. Um, get 30 people um, and then ask them those questions. You need to really prove out that product market fit, truly understand your customers' needs and what problem you're solving, and then uh, really then start uh, taking a look at where you can uh, attract the most of those customers effectively because you can spend money so quickly. Uh, and you, uh, again, going back to the landscape of VC right now, you're going to need to answer the questions on, all right, if I give you a dollar, um, you're going to get back X um, through what channel? Um, how are you going to do that? Because they're not just going to give you dollars to go test things. Um, you should be doing that yourself uh, with uh, as little money as possible. Awesome. And I would love to get to one or two more questions. We've got about nine minutes left. Um, so I'm sure each of you had a moment or moments where you thought like, wow, this is really hard. How am I ever going to to overcome what's happening right now? So what got you through that moment, that hardest time during COVID? I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly say the, the network. Um, people uh, were fortunate to be friends with with Maggie and and uh, uh, other Charlotte entrepreneurs and and so I would say uh, it was the the internal network of people who were going through the exact same thing um, and that's when uh, you can really uh, feel good about perseverance and powering through and then um, ultimately your team um, I speak volumes to uh, my co-founder Alex um, I mean him and I uh, are always talking um and uh, we just have that great synergy between the two of us that uh, you really have to lean on each other and uh, it's you're not alone and so you got to find those those support systems whether it's your team uh spouse family investors uh uh, uh other entrepreneurs and, and we did all the above and and it helped uh, tremendously um as you could sort of have put a bunch of heads together to talk about uh, innovation and and perseverance that ultimately made you feel like uh, you weren't alone and so that that's a major component of it for us, what got us through it was recognizing as hard as it was on us, it was 100x harder on our customers. Our customers were health systems. Health systems were getting overwhelmed. Their beds were full. People uh, you know, were struggling with uh, serious infections, getting hospitalized, dying without family members next to them. Nurses were working 18-hour shifts. And so for us, it was, uh, we've got to hang in there the best we can. The people we uh, kind of serve every day with our products uh, are having a much harder go of it than even we are. So it became more of a what can we do to help uh, lighten the load, and that's what kept us going through it. Yeah, we were we were very much on the same boat. I mean, on our end, the ability to actually help fight the virus and help these arenas do their disinfecting, it really was a rally cry for our team. Where on the front end, I'd say it was definitely relying on the team, you know, and understanding our mission, you know, remaining. Continuing to be excited about what we're doing was definitely important, but once we kind of got, you know, once we made the decision of moving forward on the disinfecting drone, it was actually very much, uh, it was a rally cry for us. Um, being able to actually help in the fight was something that we were all able to really get around and be excited for. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to that. I would echo, I would echo, you know, Dan, what Dan said specifically. I think it's the network. It was the team that really took, you know, stood up to the plate um, and really used it as a time to to build more momentum and rally kind of more morale than, you know, because I think everybody was like, all right, like this is what we're good at. Like we're good at, you know, chaos and and kind of navigating our way through it. And we've done this before in, in a lesser degree. And I think really kind of seeing you. Know, Crises like this show you who your leaders are and waking up every day, getting, you know, validating how strong of a team was around this and ultimately how much we believed in the mission and still do. Like it was just an excitement of like we're pushing through. There's something really valuable and meaningful that we're that we're trying to deliver and bring to the pet parents in the world. And, um, you know, it's just it was just let's fight another day um, for as long as we can. Awesome. That's great insight from all of you on that that topic. This um, question is specifically for, for Adrian. How can drones help and what role would you see your company playing in the major supply chain issues we're seeing globally? Uh, 
Can you hear me? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Yes. Awesome. Yeah, so I mean, that last mile delivery is obviously a ginormous problem in across a ton of industries, right? Logistics is is a problem that a lot of people face and drones, drones are going to solve the problem. Um, I don't know if whether it'll be in five years, 10 years, um, there are significant regulatory hurdles. Um, I mean, I, th I think there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be put in place when you really think through wide scale drone delivery. Um, I mean, you think of, let's say Amazon started delivering packages um, via drones. Just think about the sheer volume that they that they move. You will have drones, I mean, literally all over the place. Um, that is something that can happen. It's not necessarily a scary world, but it's one that needs to be highly regulated. Um, so there are companies uh, in the drone space that that, that is their focus, um, is delivery drones. And they are kind of operating in a vacuum because they, one, they have to test, you know, in the middle of Oklahoma with, you know, hundreds of acres where they aren't really operating in dense urban environments. So there's a tech, there's a technological hurdle as well to actually being able to deliver, particularly in cities. Um, you know, thankfully for us, we've actually, you know, we, we clean buildings. So we operate in really close proximity to buildings, which has given us some insight into problems that other people in the drone space don't really have, um, particularly these, you know, these delivery companies. And again, working, it's something that we look at. We're very aware that we can, it's a humongous opportunity, obviously. That's a 12 figure industry. Um, it's a 12 figure opportunity. But with that being said, that I don't see that gaining traction in the next couple of years because there's just a ton of infrastructure that needs to happen. I mean, with with the FAA, like with airplanes, you have your, you know, your your air air traffic controllers, you have your control towers. There's crazy amounts of communication with every single plane that's in the air and drones delivering things. I mean, it's going to be orders of magnitude more just in sheer volume of aircrafts in the air. It's it's significant. So again, it is going to happen, but I think we're we're a bit of a ways away. Thanks, Adrian. All right, it is time to wrap up this morning. Thank you again um, to all of the panelists for being here, um, for having this discussion with us today. Um, you guys all had some, some great information and great insight. And for um, our audience, make sure you stay up to date with Charlotte Inno. Um, if you haven't checked out our website, please do so and join our newsletter. Um, the Beat comes out on Tuesday and Thursday mornings, and we would love to have you subscribe. Um, that's a wrap for today. So I hope everybody has a, a great Thursday. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.